Document is a hard edge, non-representational painting. With it, you are to fill a half sheet painting or use a half sheet of watercolor paper to create a painting with no specific subject matter, no objects. It's a non-representational or otherwise known as a non-objective painting. One of the primary requirements is that it be hard-edged, predominantly hard-edged, rather than wet-on-wet. -wet. It may have small areas or some areas of wet-on-wet -wet technique, but the overall effect should be one of a hard-edged painting. You may do this by using masking tape or miska or some other type of uh, block out. <clears throat> or you can paint it freehand and then let each layer dry before painting the next layer so you minimize the amount of wet on wet effect. <clears throat> One of the more likely goals is to overlap colors to get transparent layers, which will give it more visual depth. <clears throat> A little historical context. In the 1950s, Frank Stella created a series of large paintings that has become known as the Protractor series because it appears as if he used a protractor to draw these geometric shapes. This new movement or new style in art was made possible by the invention of acrylic polymer paints, water-based paints that would dry rather quickly. It would not be practical to do an oil painting, masking off these areas, painting the one color, waiting a week or two for the oil paint to dry, and then painting the next color. <clears throat> With acrylic polymer paints, uh, you can move through it rather rapidly. That particular painting, titled Heron 2, is actually inspired by a place, Heron, and uh, therefore it uh, could be considered an abstract, but it is not visually representing that place that I know of anyway. This painting is located in the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. <clears throat> there are three major Guggenheim museums, art museums, that I'm aware of. Bilbao, Bilbao, Spain, I'm sorry, on the north coast of Spain. One in Venice and the very famous one in New York City designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. Well, that aside, that's just the location of that particular painting. <clears throat> in 2016, uh, the Fort Worth Modern Art Museum, along with the Whitney Museum <clears throat> of American Art in New York City, created a Frank Stella retrospective show. And I found uh, these images on the internet advertising that exhibition. It's not a particularly good example for this watercolor assignment. It just puts this type of painting into a larger historic perspective. And I say this is not a particularly good example because there is no overlapping of color to create transparent layers. This would be technically a very difficult painting to pull off with this assignment because of that thin white border between each of the colors. <coughs> <coughs> I would be remiss in not sharing with you several small paintings I have in the department that were done by Godman Schick. I believe this was in the 1990s. I did not look up the year he graduated. But with this assignment, he did a painting that he liked enough that he ended up doing a whole series of non-objective hard edge paintings and they look kind of like wallpaper. 
the really interesting thing about this series that Godman did is that he did not use masking tape. He sketched, lightly sketched the lines and then painted in, or the, the, the design, and then painted in the flat wash areas uh, one at a time without masking off any of the areas. Tremendous amount of technical control to get those flat areas of color so uniform across the paper uh, without using any masking tape to, to uh, protect the adjacent areas. <clears throat> I have three examples of this series that I kept or he donated to the department. Like I said, they look a lot like wallpaper. I'm very intrigued by the technical aspect of it. Uh, there is very little overlapping of color. So in that respect, uh, there's a weakness in these relative to this specific assignment. Yeah, it will probably enhance your grade to have some overlapping color, but it's not an absolute requirement. If you want to keep the color areas, color shapes completely independent, you feel strongly about that, then go for it. <coughs> I have several paintings uh, or photographs of paintings. I don't actually have these paintings, and I, to my knowledge, I do not have information on who did them. So we're just saying an unknown Harding alumnus. And this painting did a, this artist did a pretty good job of overlapping areas to create layers. If you will notice particularly right here, we have uh, four different blue rectangles and one red rectangle that this orange rectangle is overlapping. So we're getting quite a complex layer of colors in this area. It's another area we're getting this nice complex area of this color overlapping, this color on top of this color, this color red overlapping both of these, creating right here it's subtle, but again there's two different colors in this small area. So there's several areas where I think this one works really well. Uh, it could have really a lot more of this overlapping going on to make it even more dynamic. <clears throat> this painting is an interesting positive negative. Uh, so the color shapes are being balanced by the equal thickness of the color spaces, the negative, the, the white spaces between them. So we have this positive negative push pull. Uh, no tan is another term for this positive negative and uh, so this has some interesting characteristics it is rather uh, singular in in one plane it doesn't have these overlapping planes to give it visual depth from front to back but yet it's uh, it is an interesting play of interlocking or flowing uh, rectilinear shapes. <clears throat> this is similar in that there's no overlap and uh, here these three diagonal bands cut across an otherwise very predictable rectilinear layout of, of patterns of designs and once the uh, uh, the rectangular shapes and the diagonals were created, it was uh, then quite simple just to assign different colors to break up uh, the color of any one object. So this rectangle is now two colors. This rectangle is now two colors. Some use of, of uh, blue and orange uh, is going on. Those are complements. Red and green are complements. So we have a double complementary color scheme happening in this painting. A potential weakness here is that there's no dominance and subordinates. Uh, it could be argued that blue is slightly dominant. The blue color kind of jumps off the page, to me anyway. But not much more than the orange. Uh, 
so the colors are kind of fighting for attention. Well, that could be a visual conflict that an artist is going for. And again, there's no transparent layers, and there's a lot of potential here for transparent layering with some other diagonals. A lot of transparent layering here, but this one lacks the cleanness of this one. Uh, a lot of brushwork here, which uh, leaves the wet-on-wet -wet feel to it. Nothing wrong with that. You can have some wet-on-wet -wet motif going on. Uh, the wet-on-wet -wet motif here, though, doesn't feel deliberate. Uh, it's more likely from overbrushing. Uh, masking tape was used, but the masking tape was not adhered well to the paper. As we have these areas where the paint is bleeding out, out from under the tape. And that's okay. It's all over the painting, so it kind of works, kind of doesn't. Uh, I do think this would have been better had the top layers of paint been put on more quickly. For instance, this blue layer is put onto the orange and red layer overlapping, but there is enough brushwork that the layers are beginning to mix, so you lose some of that transparent buildup. You lose a lot of it over here in this one. Again, there's some interesting things going on. Uh, it appears they used black on this, and it does uh, does give your, your eyes some, some positive, negative, dark light areas to go into. Um, I think that the black is probably used too much on this and would have been better had they not used black at all. Uh, anyway, it's, it's got some interesting things going on. There are some areas where you have multiple uh, things overlapping, multiple rectangles overlapping each other. It's the strength of this one. <clears throat> I found several images out on the internet. I just did a Google search for watercolor images to see what I could find. And the vast majority are wet on wet. But there are a few examples of, of uh, something that is similar to this assignment. These are freehand circles, nicely overlapping each other with transparency. It is a, I think the weakness of this one is simply that they're clustered here in the middle. They don't grow out to the edges or even off the edges of the paper. Some potential to have more overlap but it's a nice beginning of a painting. But again, this is freehand circles, which are different. They have a little more organic feel than masking uh, does. Masking gives you a very rigid hard edge, which may or may not be what you want. <clears throat> All right, so this is really different. And this painting could <clears throat> almost fall under either the wet-on-wet non-objective or the hard-edge non-objective. But because of all of the hard edges, even though it is looks like an abstract expressionist piece, a lot of dynamic stuff going on, you can almost see the artist dripping and dropping and throwing the paint at the surface, uh, maybe inspired by Jackson Pollock and his drip paintings. So it's not a bad approach, and the dominance here really is hard-edged with the quite a bit of wet on wet within the larger masses. But I would use this one, I, I'm showing it to illustrate that this does not have to be a highly controlled or a geometric, uh, it can have some spontaneity, some expressive potential. So there's a lot of variations in how you might want to approach this assignment. <clears throat> Another example, uh, and this one kind of wavers between wet on wet and hard edge, but um, it 
has a little more, it has more hard edgedness to it than it does the wet on wet. There is a lot of wet on wet textural stuff going on within the color areas. But again, there's some, there's some um, potential here. I just want to show you a variety of forms, variety of approaches. This one has a nice flowing quality to it. It is painted freehand. It is predominantly hard edged. It has some wet on wet passages. This same approach could be used with no wet on wet simply by letting each color dry before the next color is applied. And that would be a variation on this particular approach that has a lot of potential, but so does this one. Uh, this, these websites of these that I found I'm including uh, to give them credit where credit is due. But again, uh, it is predominantly hard edged and it is non-objective. A variation on it, the same website. Uh, we have a warm color, well this is a warm cool color, and these are our cool colors. And again, we have these dynamic visual flow across the page, free-handed. Well, that is the PowerPoint on non-objective, hard-edged, or non-representational, hard-edged painting. Those are the parameters. That is your assignment. Have fun.